All right, welcome back to the Crimson Flag Podcast, where we bring you a class-conscious analysis of historic and current events which are pertinent to the international working class movement. All right, so today we have part two of my interview with Professor of Politics with East China Normal University, Professor Joseph Gregory Mahoney. All right, so in part two, we discussed the Cultural Revolution and other events related to it. Um, now, we decided that we're going to add a part three to this series to close it out, um, and that's going to come next week. Our main reason for doing so is two things. We admittedly got a little distracted from our main topic in this episode. You can consider it some bonus insight. And secondly, because our conversation had to be cut short, we were at my university where I attend, and we were using a room, and one of the employees had to leave, so we had to cut it a little bit short. So yeah, for that reason, we're going to dive a little deeper into the Cultural Revolution next week. So without further ado, here's part two of my interview with Professor Joseph Gregory Mahoney. And so this is where we get to um, uh, the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're going to see these mouse study groups that are pushed out into the, into the public um, in 66, in 1966. Now, the story of the Cultural Revolution, again, right, that the story that we always hear is that this is a leftist, uh, a radical leftist push, and uh, it goes from 66 uh, to 76, and it's Mao's last revolution, it's his last gasp, and it's the exhaustion of leftism in China, mm -hmm. right? And uh, they're, they're a leftist, and, and I, I, in my heart of hearts, I'm a radical leftist and I've paid the price for it. But uh, and I would like to believe it's true. And I and I have I have Chinese friends who are radical leftists, many of them who are living in exile in the United States, who who believe that version of the story. And I would like to believe them. Uh, I would like to believe it with them. But I don't think that's what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to talk about now. Rather, and I'll try to talk through it very quickly um, and hit the key points, and this is where uh, the story gets really controversial again. Um, in 66, Mao mobilized the urban left. Now, you have to remember that Mao has three power bases at this point in time. Urban left, rural areas, the countryside, the peasants, and the army. Okay. And you have to recall that with Lin Biao and the little cultural revolution he starts in the army before the big cultural revolution, he's basically solidifying. He's removed Peng and he's solidifying his power base in the military. Okay, so that's the first strategic step. The second is he mobilizes the urban left with the Red Guards, the study groups, and all these things. And he uses the urban left to knock down the urban right. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. And all of this is, is reaching an end point by 1968. Right? Which is when Mao Zedong declares the Cultural Revolution over right and calls out the military that's now firmly under his control to suppress whatever red guard elements uh, refuse to demobilize right and one of the most fascinating little pieces of history you can find this on marxist.org under the Mao Zedong uh, pages is, is uh, uh, Mao talks to leaders of red guard factions in Beijing that's some some title like this and uh, and it's a fascinating, you know, Mao's like, you're wondering who the black hand is who called out uh, the army uh, to suppress the Red Guards. He goes, it was me. <laughs> okay. And then Jiang Qing is, uh, there's like these, uh, these Red Guard leaders who are there who are um, kissing Jiang Qing's ass. And Mao says, you're idiots for kissing her ass. She doesn't know anything. Uh, oh, really? oh, wow. <laughs> so, so there's all this sort of, you know, and, and Zhou Enlai is in that meeting and, and, uh, and so it's it's a very fascinating, and the other thing that's really fascinating is if you, if you understand dialectics, Mao is is almost talking like a dialectical mystic. Like everything there is intensely a dialectical discussion, and it's clear that most people have no idea what he's talking about in that moment. But I think he does. I think he knows precisely what he's doing. Um, 
So what happens next is you take everyone, right, the, the young people, and you send them down to the countryside. Mm -hmm. So whoever was going to, uh, who, who uh, now this, this being sent down to the countryside movement, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, a lot of people, uh, um, th this gets sold as uh, you have to go learn from the peasants. And uh, you have to recall that the first being sent down moment in, in the Chinese communist history is Mao uh, going down in 1926 to Hunan to investigate uh, the, the peasant terror there and saying, oh my God, there's something we can learn from this. And then coming back and reporting to the party and the party laughing him out of town because they were following the Leninist uh, uh, model. And then, you know, the base areas where Mao goes out and starts building the base areas and, the, and then the party loses its ass in 27 and 28. And where do they have to go? They have to go to the countryside to recover. And then they lose their ass again because the the, the Moscow's uh, communists reassert control in the Jiangxi Soviet. And then they have to end up on the, the, the long march, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're in uh, Yan'an in the rural base area. And so, but but also the, the, the really big sent down moment for the party is the long march itself where they have to do this. You know, and that's where they, uh, you know, all these people who, it winnows out anyone who isn't firmly committed and it's sort of a Darwinistic, you know, survival of the fittest sort of thing. But it's also uh, where people um, who, who were thinking about Marxism from an abstract or, or you know, French experience because some of them have been to France or, or, or Soviet experience because some of them had trained in, in Moscow. Now they have to start thinking, okay, this is actually the, I mean, these were like the best and brightest people from urban areas. And they had real no, really no idea how 90% of their country lived or, but that's the country they aim to. So this becomes that, that educational moment in, in party history. And it's a big part of, of, of the, 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 the founding story of, of not only Mao Zedong thought, but the party itself. So that becomes part of, of their tradition. And, um, and so it's quite normal for the party to say, you know what, we, we're going to send these people down to the countryside because they need to know what, what country they're trying to, to lead and be part of. Um, and they're romanticizing it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this is very popular with the peasants who, who think, oh, yeah. But, you know, it turns out, it turns out, and this is one of the, this, this history is only recently uh, starting to be told in China and quantified that it's it's not simply that the the peasants are going to teach the these urban youth uh, the reality of China. The peasants themselves are not idiots, right? How do they put most of these young people to work as teachers, oh. as accountants, right? So you needed someone who could handle the accounts of your collective collectivized farm and you you wanted school teachers for your children right you're not going to put them to work in the rice paddy they're not very they're not going to be very useful there and it's a waste of talent what do you want you want to educate your children and so it's not just you're going to learn from the peasants but this is also where we see the massive uptick in literacy in china mm -hmm. but also female literacy because that's where you have all these people, these sent down youth uh, who become uh, teachers and who become managers of these farms. And it, it becomes a major driving positive force. We remember it as a negative thing, but it's actually this massive development scheme at work underneath. But there's something else that's, that's, that, that is going along with it, which is Mao is uh, getting ready, I think, because he spent all of these years demonizing now both, and you really see this in starting in 61, this massive open attack on Russia, on, on the Soviet Union. It's huge, and all these pamphlets and polemics against uh, the Soviet Union, the Soviet revisionism, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and Deng Xiaoping was a big part of a lot of that. Um, but I know that he was helping write a lot of those theories as well. Probably. Mm -hmm. um, and so then what happens is, so, you know, but you're, you're in this position where 
you've come to the conclusion that you're going to have to draw close to either the Soviet Union or the United States, right? Yeah. <laughs> because the technology gap is expanding. And the only way that you can deal with that danger is that you have to draw close to one and hope for investment and technology transfer. Mm -hmm. And that that relationship helps protect you from the other. Right. So then if you're going to do this, this is going to be very upsetting. OK, it's going to be very, very upsetting. Mm -hmm. And who's it going to be most upsetting to? The, the left. Who, the urban yeah, left, right? right? Who've been following every word you've said, where you've been, you know, talking about how nasty the Soviets are and how nasty the Americans are. But the the deeper, darker, difficult question is, which country are you going to draw close to? Right. Yeah. And I suspect that Mao isn't certain in '66, but that he's moving in the direction of the United States. Mm -hmm for two reasons. First, you've been having this huge, nasty spat with Soviet Union already. Okay. And remember in 56, I don't know if I said this earlier, but in 56, Mao says the Soviet Union is going to collapse. Uh oh, so because he's thinking they're probably out the door anyway well he thinks that they're not going to be a viable long-term partner and that they're in a period of decline that they're going to stagnate and decline because they've thrown away their capacity for revolution and for exerting control when it's necessary and therefore their whole political system is not going to have the tools it needs to accelerate growth and development therefore they will stagnate therefore not only will they collapse but they will be a danger in their decline okay i mean a country in decline is more dangerous than than one that's that's secure in its in its in its level mm -hmm. so uh, i think mao uh i suspect that mao is is at that moment uh looking at a very stark future where he's going to face the soviet union as a near enemy and the united states will be distant and um but that eventually the Soviet Union will fall and China will have to face the United States on its own and that you will need to have some sort of strange relationship with the United States to mitigate that risk. So I think this is why and this is the key point that we have to struggle with. This was this was the thing that really drove me into this rethinking is that in late 68 when, when Mao when Mao is declaring the end of the of the Great Leap um, there's some indication that he's already sending Edgar Snow, the, the, the Western journalist who wrote Red Star Over China and who introduces you know, the communist leadership to Western readers, that he's trying to g use Edgar Snow to, to make overtures to the United States through the CIA that China wants to talk. Mm -hmm. um, but whether or, not, whether or not that begins in 68, we, we, def we, we know that it's taking place in 69. And we know that in early 1969, Mao Zedong commissions a report from the PLA leadership. And the report is, which country should we draw close to, the United States or the Soviet Union? And the generals answer, the United States. Now remember, the party controls the military, mm -hmm. and Mao controls the party and the military. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he left this to their objective, you know, conclusion. In other words, in all likelihood, he prefigured, you know, he they were they were told what side uh, to choose. OK. Yeah. And so um, that's when we see well, that's when we absolutely know uh, two things happen um, uh, that, that China is is definitely uh, without without question, reaching out to the United States, and that's when we start to see uh, the border war between the Soviet Union and China. Oh, okay. But before that moment takes place, we have uh, the break with Vietnam, China's break with Vietnam. Now, in Chinese history, this history is is told in, in China today. In fact, we don't talk about it much, and we're not we're not really supposed to talk about the though in China we're not supposed to talk about the 
the the Sino uh, Vietnamese War in 1979, mm. but uh, because it's very taboo and and uh, and still very contested, and you know why why did it happen and what did it achieve and so forth and so on. But the the key point is that in '68, the Vietnamese communist realize that they can't win with China. Mm. That they need Soviet tech. Yeah, because you mentioned in the beginning they they are working with China and China starts experiencing these issues with supplying them like the technology and the, or technology, the weapons. Or, it's just not keeping pace with the American technology. Oh. The thing is, is that in order for the Vietnamese to get support from the Soviets, they have to break with China. And this is deeply upsetting to China. And China does not want, cannot afford to admit to, to its people or to itself or to the world that the real reason why the Vietnamese are breaking is because their technology is not capable. Because mm-hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a risk to your own sovereignty. If, you, if you're not able to, to help the Vietnamese win in a relatively limited war. Yeah, in a you wouldn't want to let the world know that. Well, you wouldn't out. let you wouldn't want to let your own people know it because it would yeah. undermine your own legitimacy. Um, so this is this is the <laughs> this is the the sort of the dark uh, uh, moment where the Vietnamese turn to the Soviets for military aid and support, but the cost is they have to break with the Chinese, and the Chinese uh, present this in terms of propaganda as a, a gross betrayal and why the Vietnamese can't be trusted and yada, yada, yada. Um, but it's really just a, a necessary strategic maneuver on the Vietnamese part, I think. Um, but uh, it, it has lasting a lasting uh, legacy, right? And, um, you know, a lot of people don't even acknowledge in Vietnam that Ho Chi Minh's wife was Chinese and, uh, you know, it was this really deep relationship between the two countries or the extent to which the Chinese were responsible for defeating the French and so forth and so on. Um, instead, you know, they just go back to this ancient uh, imperial narrative where the Chinese had, had at one point for a, a relatively brief period of time, more than a thousand years ago, had asserted imperial control over Vietnam. And so this becomes the narrative that China is trying to you know, assert uh, imperial control. And this is the, the story that the Vietnamese leadership tells its people for its break with China, um, which is, you know, uh, so they're both they're both not being honest about the the reason. No, sorry, but I, I've heard that mentioned before. Um, the the war between China and um, Vietnam thousands or a thousand years ago. But um, you're saying that the Vietnamese leadership they were citing that at the time. Yeah, well, it plays in. It's it's a convenient narrative. Yeah. Right? Okay. I um, see what you're saying. For uh, an, a, a difficult break. Uh, that has to be sort of explained to people in ways that they can understand, right? Because uh, you have to remember that there were a lot of Chinese in Vietnam, Mm. a lot of Chinese, Vietnamese, ethnic Chinese in Vietnam. And um, how are you going to deal with that? And how are you going to mobilize to confront that problem? And uh, so, you know, you have to have some sort of narrative that you can use to explain to your own people um, for this this radical break that's being necessitated by the Soviet Union, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but my point is, you know, that, that the Chinese knew that this was a, a, a strategic fail point, that they that they were no longer had access to. So that's what's happening in '68. You know, they already know that this problem is growing in '61, and '62, and '63. They already know that the Great Leap wasn't enough, despite all of its incredible success, which again sounds so odd to say, uh, but it wasn't enough to close the gap and that it won't be enough. And what they now have to do is strategically find a way to draw close uh, to one of the great powers. And it's going to have to be uh, the United States and Mao's mind. And by 69, we know that this is decided uh, unambiguously and they're moving in that direction. And we know that shortly thereafter, once the United States becomes clear that that's what China is actually trying to do, then that's when we see Kissinger and Nixon, they come running, mm-hmm. right? Because they see this as a strategic opportunity um, and um, in the Cold War. Um, so this raises sort of a very difficult question for us um, because we, we uh, there, there are, uh, the, the thing that we that we so often struggle with is this idea that the Cultural Revolution 
runs from 66 to 76 when Mao dies, mm -hmm. right? And yet he says it's fun. He he himself says it's done in sixty eight. Right, right. So if you're really a leftist and you're really following Mao Zedong, then it ended in sixty eight. Okay, and then that's the year that he starts reaching out to the number one capitalist country in the world. <laughs> and and yeah. I was. You know, we 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 remember Deng Xiaoping for reform and opening up, but actually, it was Mao Zedong who opened up. Mm -hmm. It was Mao Zedong who invited the United States in, right? It was Mao Zedong that began, and so then you have to ask the question: Was the Cultural Revolution really all the strategic maneuver to? position for opening up to the United States. And we come back now to the two big deaths, the two most famous people who lose their lives during the, 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 the cultural revolution, Lu Xiaoqi and Lin Biao. And why, and first of all, you know, there's, there's sometimes this, this Miss, uh, this this mistelling of the of the story that uh, uh, Lu Xiaoqi was killed by Red Guards. He was roughed up in a in a so-called struggle session. I don't want to diminish that. Um, he was a very old man, and he was already relatively frail, um, and he does not recover from that experience. Right, but he dies in hospital. Um, and the second is Lin Biao, who, by all reports, he's either responsible for the coup that, that is launched against Mao, or his son is responsible for it, but he knows that he will be held responsible for it. Mm -hmm. uh, because in the party, you are held responsible for what your family does. Mm -hmm. This is one of the party rules. Uh, and um, and he was second in command, and so it, it's believed, if, if the story is, is true, that his son launches the coup and tries to assassinate Mao, in order to advance his father into the first position. Um, and according to the official history, when it becomes clear that the coup has failed, Lin Biao packs up his family and starts flying to Russia. Okay? Yeah. And uh, his plane run out, runs out of gas somewhere over Mongolia. There are other people who say, no, he was shot down. Um, but I'm not that interested in that level of detail. What's more interesting is uh, no one kind of disputes where he was going, which yeah. is right. the Soviet Union. Okay, and this this brings us back to I think what were the two key what what, what were the what was the key failing associated with Lu Xiaoqi and Lin Biao, and I suspect and there's quite a bit of evidence to support this that they wanted to move in the direction of the Soviet Union, that they were not interested in creating a relationship with the United States. And so why are they being purged? It's not because they are capitalist rotors. That's that's <laughs> like rhetoric misdirection, okay? Because we're actually going to move in the direction of the United States, right? Why are we going to knock down the urban right? Because we're getting ready to piss off the urban left and the urban right will always hate us and we have to knock them down first before we get rid of the urban left by demobilizing them down to the countryside so they don't turn against us when we move towards the United States or the Soviet Union but, but more likely mm -hmm. the United States. And so I think Liu Xiaoqi is the first to fall because his, his inclination is towards the Soviet Union and I think Lin Biao falls uh, largely because, uh, probably because of a number of reasons, but 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 there's some evidence to suggest that he also favors uh, the Soviet Union, and that's intolerable. So uh, these two things are moving. So then we have to ask, okay, well then is is the whole Cultural Revolution really table setting for opening up to the United States? And that's again the the, the difficult question because. Yeah. 66, we, we, again, we remember the Cultural Revolution, misremember perhaps, the Cultural Revolution is lasting from 66 to 76. 
And yet, it's in the early 70s when Mao opens to the United States. How do you reconcile that movement with a radical leftist interpretation of what's taking place otherwise during that 10 year period? Okay, that's that's the, the difficult uh, thing to 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 um, to reconcile because they seem contradictory at first. Um, you know, I wanted to make a comment. I can't remember this um, historian's name, but he made a comment about Lenin and he was saying the reason why Lenin was successful. Like there's a lot of character traits you could look at, but one of the biggest um, one of the things that was most important was that Lenin was able to recognize when he had to repudiate his ideas to achieve his larger aims. And um, there's different times, like we could look at the NEP as an example of that possibly. Um, but I, would you say maybe that's kind of what Mao is doing here? Is, you know, he has larger aims. So he's, you know, using the Cultural Revolution to achieve certain aims, but he's really, like you said, trying to position himself somewhere else. I know a lot of communists, we tend to like think of things as, well, you're either for the opening up or you're for the cultural revolution, where it seems like your argument is Mao is seeing these things as beneficial for different reasons and almost complementary to each other. Well, you know what, uh, when, I f when I first went to work in, in Beijing, I worked for uh, a time in, uh, um, in Beijing with uh, the top think tank under the Central Committee uh, of the Communist Party there, and um, um, this was back in uh, 2010, and was there in residence with him for about a year, and then was a senior fellow with him for many years going forward. Um, and I remember I was discussing, uh, because m my area of interest was Marxism and and um, theory and, and these sorts of things. And I was having this conversation with this old communist cadre there in the, in the think tank. And he says, listen, he says, you, you're making a, a mistake in your thinking. He says, we come up with theory after we've figured out the politics, okay? Marxism, and, and and this sounds like a violation, all right? It sounds like a vulgarism, but it isn't, right? In Marxism, what are you what are you concerned about first? Um, what works? Practical, yeah, practical reality, like, and then the theory forms out of the practice. Yeah, how do you how do you deal with the injustice and the vulnerability and the problems that you actually have? And when you come face to face with that, then you develop a theory. Mm -hmm. And then you use that theory until you find that you have to modify it, either because the theory was wrong or because the circumstances have changed and you have to rethink things, right? Now, the one thing that, that even Western uh, American scholars who generally uh, I don't hold in high regard, and I've trained with some of the best of them, and some of them are, are personal friends of mine, um, and, and some were directors of my dissertation. Um, but the one thing that, that everyone agrees, about, almost everyone agrees about, uh, is that the most, re most remarkable thing about the Communist Party of China, in fact, what distinguishes it from the Soviet Party is it's incredible capacity for adaptation and change, right? And this, I think, is because that's what the party had to do in the early years of its own existence, right? In other words, it had to radically change itself and rethink itself, right, to survive the uprising in 27 and 28, and then the, co the collapse of the Jiangxi Soviet, and then recover from uh, that with the, with the period in Yan'an, and then, you know, how do we recover from the Great Leap, and then, how, you know, so you have this, uh, the, first of all, this incredible party apparatus that Mao builds that, that no other party builds comparably, 
uh, but also the way that it's able to radically alter course, right, to fit the, the, the needs of the moment. The other thing is that uh, I've sometimes heard some Chinese uh, Marxists say that uh, Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up is really the Chinese equivalent of the NEP. Okay, and I find that this is kind of a kind of an ahistorical comparison. Uh, I'm a little more satisfied with um, the Chinese who who uh, the Chinese Marxists who acknowledge um, from a classical Marxist position, and this is going to irritate uh, listeners, and it would have irritated me 20 years ago. Um, you know, Marx. When Marx is talking about Mar what we would later call Marxism, he's speaking about it normatively within the era of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. And he's talking about, you know, capitalism is a period of human development in which we acquire technology and capital, but also critical consciousness and that all of these things are th are things that have to be acquired before we can advance to that next stage of development okay and he says whether we like this or not that's what's happening right because capitalism is already I mean he's he's talking about these issues in the midst of capitalism right and um, but he also says that there are some contradictions within capitalism, and the only way to resolve these contradictions are, are through socialism. And so, you know, this is where you know he starts to, and, and that there's through socialism that we will begin to resolve some of the injustices, and that will that we'll be able to encounter uh, the next stage of of our development. And then, of course, you have uh, people like Bertrand Russell and and uh, Dewey who are going to say, "Oh, this is determinism." Marx says that uh, we're going to. Uh, this is economic determinism. We're going to become uh, socialist and Marxist, whether we like it or not. And Marx never says this. Marx says, no, no, you have to struggle for it. You have to build it. You have to fight for it. Uh, but it's possible because the contradictions that exist can be resolved through. And it seems logical to suggest that, the, that a higher stage of development would be one where these social contradictions are resolved positively, but can be resolved positively through socialism. Um, but we'll have to commit ourselves to that and become those agents of change in order to make that happen. Um, so I think this is where you you have. Um, I, I would I would be very careful. A after that, I, I, it took me a, a few years to digest. What do you mean the idea? You know, um, what do you mean? You know, I, I shouldn't be committed to socialism or communism or or these things in a in an immediate sense. Does that mean that it's that it's okay to wear Nikes and polo and and to um, uh, hire someone to clean my house and, and to even to buy a house and, and to invest in the market. I mean, it, you know, where's the line? Where, you know, where's the moral hazard? And you know, these are all, of course, uh, questions that we have to actually deal with in, in, in the reality that we live in, in the capitalist reality we live in. It's not like you can go to Goodwill or the thrift shop and you somehow have avoided uh, being contaminated by the sins of commodity fetishism. In fact, I would even argue that when you buy clothes from Goodwill, you're actually uh, uh, more perversely engaging in commodity fetishism. You're like, you know, you're now re-commodifying the clothing in, in a way that's exploiting workers, uh, and disabled workers, right? In so much as Goodwill has this awful business model for doing that, and then don't they don't even pay taxes and they're not even contributing to the public treasury. So blah 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 right uh, I remember <laughs> I've, I've had people criticize me because uh, because uh, uh, maybe I wasn't wearing the right brand you're not really a communist and and uh, and I even had this time I even had this time where I, where I didn't like to wear ties because I thought uh, you know that's too bourgeois uh, but you know linen that's a common thing in the west amongst western communists I've heard that's a joke about western communists like that other um, communists from other countries because they're always wearing ties they're always wearing suits stuff like that and you know who starts this is Lenin mm -hmm. it's Lenin because he wants to professionalize the revolutionary yeah and you know we have to remember that the that the suit the business suit what we call the business suit today was actually uh, derived from the military uniform and so 
and we know that the corporations like you know IBM and these other groups they have very strict rules on your suit has to be black or blue your tie has to be white or this color the tie has to be relatively conservative you know because it's, it's a uniform right? mm -hmm. um, and so Lenin is trying to um, um, bring that sort of professionalism um, and in China we see them we see them wearing ties and when I do TV you know I, I uh, and I do a lot of TV I, I now wear a tie and I try to look good I try to have a, a, a professional appearance uh, because it conveys a certain type of legitimacy and um, um, it's kind of a silly thing but uh, but that's that's uh, it's not even really a, a <laughs> A controversy in other parts of the world, but yeah. but for some reason we've got this image of the of the communist in America as a blue collar worker, when in fact uh, a great number of them are uh, used to be tenured professors uh, who liked to you know have a certain burliness to their appearance because it gave them some sort of political legitimacy, mm -hmm. um, or you know today of course uh, tenured workers are are a thing of the past largely. Well, you know, I would I would compare it to I, I would say that one of the big mistakes that we make in the workers' movement is in in, in the and the, the 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 protest movement in um, uh, America is that we present ourselves too often as a counterculture, um, as a as a uh, unkempt, as an unclean uh, group, as a lazy group. Okay, mm -hmm. not a professional group, as a half acidness uh, to it, right? As a bunch of pot, I don't know, whatever it yeah. is, right? And um, I would, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something rather controversial because I don't like the group in terms of what they stood for, but uh, the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. the way you know they would dress and still dress, very impressive, right? In other words, it, there's a militancy to the appearance, right? I mean, there's. There's a militancy to how you present yourself and how you uh, engage, and this conveys a sense of dignity and self-respect, and and that you're, you know, uh, adhering to to some type of standard, because ultimately what you want to do is bring that militancy to bear, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not just a, a war, uh, as as Gramsci put it. Our our goal isn't simply a war of of uh, position, but a war of maneuver eventually, right? Uh, and that requires a certain type of militancy, um, you know, um, and that requires a certain type of discipline. But uh, too often we don't see this. We see a resistance to discipline because what we see is a resistance to the disciplining effects of uh, this. This still, even though we're in the information age, this still dominant industrial culture that is so exploitative and, uh, and so I think people become a little confused in their resistance in their presentation and uh, end up uh, um, it not being the most important um, um, reason for for our failure but but one of the reasons why we have not succeeded um, yeah there's a lot of theories why that may have happened um, like you mentioned, we notice things in our capitalist system that we maybe don't like, like the rigid, like how rigid it is, like with work, or I don't know, maybe some of these certain things, but sometimes people can conceptualize that as socialism. Like we have to get rid over, di we have to get over discipline in general or something like, I think they get confused. A lot of people associate with the, this with like the new left of the 70s. There's a lot of theories about it, you know, some people will say the CIA did it on purpose to influence the hippie movement to try and take out a lot of this professional kind of aspect um, that you see before in like workers movements. Um, but nonetheless, that ended up happening either way after the 60s and 70s, it seems. And we kind of haven't seen that in America since. Well, you know, I'm, I'm based in Shanghai and, and I, I was a professor in the United States uh, and got in trouble for political reasons and was bought out and blacklisted. I'm not going to go into that personal history. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up back in China, even though my area of study was already China at that point. And I'd lived in China prior to that. And that's why I went to China, um, because that was where I could continue my career. But um, I do think the United States is reaching a period where... Um, 
where there's the where, where there are not only not only the necessity but opportunities for leftist and but uh, uh, you know take the lesson from Mao Zedong organization organization <laughs> organization okay it's all about organization it's all about being organized. I remember I was in China uh, and uh, you remember the um, the um, what was the the, 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 the the protest against Wall Street? Occupy. Occupy, mm-hmm. right. And uh, one of my former students from the United States was one of the, the leaders of, of one of those groups. And uh, he Skyped me in China. And I said, how's it going? He goes, oh, we're going to fail utterly. I said, why? He goes, well, you know, because most of the people who are coming out are soccer moms and you know they're not they're not really committed to the cause it's just sort of a popular thing for the moment and uh, the others are students but they're not really committed because they're really bourgeoisie anyway it's kind of like why did the the uprising in 68 fail in Paris right um, and uh, um, you know no one really understands how capitalism really works no one really understands no one in this country understands the extent to which their their butter that their bread is still buttered by capitalism that they're still extracting huge benefits from the rest of the world from the center periphery you know uh, circumstance that Lenin describes in, in his in his pamphlet imperialism the highest stage of, of capitalism that the United States is still deriving those benefits uh, primarily through the the functioning of the Federal Reserve and the US dollars the, as the global you know, supranational currency, but um, yeah, the, the key point is is organized. And uh, I went out uh, last year, and I I observed firsthand uh, a number of the Antifa movements in um, in clashes between the Trumpist and the Antifa groups in Washington, um, and um, and you know, of course, romantically. Uh, I have an affection for that, um, for the Antifa, but uh, uh, most of them are anarchist, mm-hmm. and Marxism has nothing to do with anarchism. Uh, you know that's was settled in the dispute between Marx and Bakunin a long time ago, and uh, uh, anarchist. The reason why the anarchist always fail is because basically they. I don't forgive me for saying this, people. But uh, uh, truth, as I see, it, and as other people see it, perhaps uh, anarchists are basically poor libertarians. They're they're you know they're people who don't want any system, any organization, right? They just want to uh, get out of my way and let me be free, and that's what really, really rich people want. The libertarians want as well. Uh, I like being rich. I like being powerful. Don't tell me what to do. Uh, you know, so the Anne Rand version of, of history. So uh, anarchists always fail because they they don't build strong organizations. They don't build uh, that type of of, uh, of system, and as a result, they're unable to effectively oppose the system that currently dominates them, and they're unable to rectify the injustices, the the the, stru- the, the structural injustices that will have to be cleaned up, even if they could take power, right? Um, Conversely, that's why we see the Chinese Communist Party, uh, I think, in, in in China being so extraordinarily successful, raising 700 million people out of poverty, eliminating extreme poverty, bringing uh, the Chinese industrial system to number one position in the world now, the number one uh, place now in the world for uh, foreign direct investment. Um, um, all of these things that are happening while it is now standing toe to toe with the United States and the United States trying to reassert its hegemonic uh, position after many years of decline, and after we we you know oh my God I mean the, 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 I don't I'm not pointing the finger at, at any leftist in America, but if you want to look at the at 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 how much work you have to do, look at the simple fact that an asshole like Donald Trump, a a fucking billionaire, was able to speak to the working class more effectively than the leftists could. I mean, that's that goes to show you how much work you have to do uh, in order 
to speak to the people that you care most about, okay? How much organization you have to do, how much class conscious. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've sort of drifted off topic, and, and I want to go back to one thing to sort of close us out in terms of the discussion of 66 or 56 yeah. to, uh, to 76. And that is this very, very interesting speech. It was at 74 that, that uh, Deng Xiaoping, and we always, we always forget that, you know, Deng is up, Deng is down, Deng is up, Deng is down. And we like to remember that Deng was in some way an enemy of Mao Zedong, and that, you know, Deng was the capitalist rotor, and, and Deng is, you know, responsible for China uh, becoming a capitalist country. And, you know, this is where David Harvey is part of the new left. I think yeah. loses his shit in that book, uh, you know, a brief history of Neil uh, of of uh, uh, or the uh, of um, he's got two books, uh, uh, New Imperialism, and his uh, brief history of neoliberalism or something like this. Mm -hmm. And on the cover of that uh, book, um, on neoliberalism, he's got a rogues gallery like the four great villains of neoliberalism, and it's Margaret Thatcher. Sure, okay, absolutely, put her on there. Uh, Ronald Reagan. Absolutely. Uh, Pinochet in Italy. Absolutely. Put that asshole on there. And then he's got Deng Xiaoping. OK. And uh, really, you know, um, so uh, this is <laughs> that's a popular view, too. I don't know if you're aware of the book. It's called The Shock Doctrine. Um, Naomi Klein. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're reading that book, it goes through those. It goes through Margaret Thatcher, Reagan, and then it ends with Deng Xiaoping. So it seems like a popular kind of myth. It right? is. It is a. It is a kind of myth, and and it and it, it it's been very very uh, pervasive and not. It's been pervasive among the radical left and the new left in in the West. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a couple of points that you have to remember. Mao Zedong always introduces Deng Xiaoping when, when people are visiting, like foreign dignitaries. He always introduces Deng Xiaoping the same way. He says he's short, but his talent is very big. Because, you know, Deng was a, was a very short person. Mm -hmm. um, so he makes this sort of this joke about his size, but then praises him for being a large man in terms of his cap uh, capabilities. And we know that Mao uh, had a, a very high degree of trust in, in Deng Xiaoping because he often uses Deng to go solve difficult problems, perhaps even the problems associated with the Great Leap. Um, second, Mao says he's the one who will remain after the rest of us are gone. Mm. Okay. Now, why is this the case? Because Deng was younger than all the rest of the senior leaders, because Deng had lied about his age when he was a young man to go in order to go to France early. And we remember Deng Xiaoping as the second generation of Chinese leadership, but he was always there for the first generation. But he, because he was younger, he becomes you know, the, the key figure of the second generation. But um, it's very interesting that, that Mao says this about him and that he acknowledges that, that Deng will be the one that remains. Also, Mao never kills Deng or never allows him to be killed, right? There's two explanations for this. Maybe Mao wasn't someone who wantonly allowed people to get killed anyway. You know, this is sort of the image that, that some people promote vis-a-vis -vis Lu Xiaoqi, right? But uh, the other possibility is uh, um, uh, there's a difference between uh, Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, which is it doesn't appear that uh, Deng Xiaoping had a preference for the Soviet Union, which is a compelling reason for him yeah. surviving. But also because Deng Xiaoping, unlike Liu Xiaoqi, had a power base. Right? Mm -hmm. Liu Xiaoqi did not have a power base. He was simply a high-level uh, cadre and theoretician and government uh, uh, leader in the party. But Deng Xiaoping's power base was in the army. Mm. And so maybe maybe Mao knows that Deng will survive because he's, he's, he's got that power in the army. 
and someone's going to need to have that power going forward okay um, and you can't afford to kill him because you're going to split the army right I don't know there are all these who knows yeah. what's really happening there but what's most compelling is that when you look at Deng Xiaoping's selected works nothing from 66 to 76 is mentioned I know it's like, like the, the, mm -hmm. the official story yeah and almost sort of uh, erases Deng from that period of time but we know that Deng is up, Deng is down, Deng is up, Deng is down and uh, most importantly though uh, what we remember, what we should remember that we too often forget is the speech that Deng gives on Mao's behalf. Mao wrote the speech where, where Deng uh, introduces Mao's three world theory at the UN, I think it was in 74 okay, mm. where you know, you had this old idea of of three worlds. You have uh, the first world, the second world, the third world, and the first world is the most developed world. Uh, the second world is um, um, uh, the Soviet Union or whatever, and the third world is or the developing countries. Okay? Yeah, something like this. And Mao says, no, 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 no. The first world is the United States. And the Soviet Union and the second world are the various countries that are closely aligned with those two countries but as part of their imperial systems and the third world are those countries those developing countries that are seeking an independent foreign policy and an independent sovereignty and an independent development okay mm -hmm. because they know that they can achieve those things, that they will never arise above the level of second world status. You know, so the second world would be like you know, South Korea yeah. uh, and the American system and Cuba and the Soviet system and so forth and so on. And so, um, so this is what I what the, the 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 point that I will leave off on, and we can go to questions or or end as yeah. you see fit. Is that I think this idea because you know. Um, I think there's another aspect to the cultural revolution that needs to be said and that, that we need to bring back this, this discussion of, historic, of, of dialectical and historical materialism and that is the cultural revolution is also where we see the end point of a particular type of class struggle in China. Mm -hmm. Class struggle was used to reach a certain revolutionary endpoint, and that endpoint was exhausted mm. during the Cultural Revolution. But the real purpose of the Cultural Revolution is then to allow China to elevate that class struggle more effectively to the international level. So we need to culminate class struggle in China and reach a, a threshold so that we can better position ourselves strategically for class struggle internationally. I think this is what you're seeing in the three world theory and I think this is precisely what you see in terms of, of Mao Zedong's, you know, because you have this old dialectical thing in Mao Zedong. What do you do with your enemies? You get as close to them as possible. Who's your real enemy? Is it really the Soviet Union? No, because they're going to fall at some point it's the United States okay let's get as close to them as possible let's get as close to them as possible so that if they hit themselves they are hit us they risk hitting themselves okay so they're gonna they're gonna hesitate to hit us mm -hmm. and let's learn as much as we can and get as much tech and capital transfer as we can to close that gap otherwise we are vulnerable otherwise we will eventually lose okay so this to me is an, an, an intensely dialectical and uh, historical materialist perspective and I think it shows up again in this three world theory and I think it carries all the way through through what we see in the next 30 or 40 years with reform and opening up. Now does this mean that I agree with Pillsbury's uh, 100 years marathon? No. I think he has a very simplistic understanding. Um, I don't think that, the, that, uh, that China's goal, uh, as Pillsbury puts it, is to put themselves in a position so they can supplant the United States as the as the global power. But I do believe that China has been strategically positioning itself for decades so that they would be able 
to push back against American power and uh, assert themselves in, in an independent way. And I think that that's what we've been seeing, particularly as American declines have accelerated after 2008 and as China's rise has accelerated over the same period that uh, we now find ourselves in this in this period where that strategic objective, which for the Chinese, by the way, uh, has been significantly realized in 2021 with, uh, with what they describe as the achievement of the Shaokong Shui, the, the moderately prosperous society, um, which is a term that uh, Deng Xiaoping adapts from uh, uh, Confucian thought, uh, um, but uh, um, not going, I don't want to get into a long discussion of the Shaokong Shui and the Datong Shui and all these things, and, and, uh, but uh, just leave you with the joke. Uh, that I heard a Chinese Marxist say uh, it was partly a joke, but partly sincere, that the first Chinese uh, communist was uh, Confucius. Um, um, of course, that there's some problems with that and some problems with Confucius, but uh, Confucius uh, and and uh, was thinking uh, often in a materialist sense, and he was also thinking uh, under the old yin yang thought, the yin yang sushiang, in a way that wasn't. Uh, uh, completely antithetical to dialectical materialism. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why Marxism resonates with the Chinese experience, because it becomes something that fits with uh, their traditional way of thinking and valuing, which shows up in Confucius as well as Lao Tzu and, and uh, some of the other uh, deeper uh, ancient uh, ways of thinking and philosophy that we see in the Chinese experience. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I guess just to kind of like sum up everything. Um, so like starting back with the Sino-Soviet split, you know, this is a point of history where it's contended among some people. Some people will say they try and debate whose fault was it, basically. I think we can fa safely say that if you had to place blame on somebody, it was the Soviet Union. You know, it was China was forced into this situation. To be honest with you, I would say that if you're really... If you're really thinking about this dialectically mm -hmm. and more deeply in, in a properly dialectical way, you don't fall into the trap of right, wrong, left, right. Mm -hmm. Okay? The Soviet Union was doing what made sense to it in its historical moment. Mm -hmm. Okay? Were they evil? Were they necessarily doing the wrong thing or the right thing? You know, if the Soviet Union is making massive investments in another country, it would be reasonable for them to expect a return on that investment. Right. Okay. I guess I'm thinking of some deeper, I guess, yeah, some things that I would say are problematic was, for example, when the Soviet Union started allying with India. And the there was a brief war in the 60s, I believe, between China and India. And that was largely because the Soviet Union was doing development projects there in India, and they wanted to, you know, um, see that succeed. But also, I know that um, apparently Khrushchev, like, took away, he said that he was going to help assist China in acquiring nuclear weapons. And after the split happened, he was like, I... I'm changing my mind. I'm just not going to do it. And that was a thing that really upset Mao at the time. So um, I, I, I totally get what you mean. Like, you know, I don't like doing history of this was the good guy and this was the bad guy or anything like that. But I think a lot of times communists now try and sh they struggle to understand why that split happened. But yeah. You know, the, 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 the bad guy in, in Soviet history is, is Stalin. And there's little debate about this. Um, now, was Stalin forced to clean up a failed revolution? Because, you know, Lenin really thought that he had a global revolution and that you were going to have this whole world transform and that's what was going to allow this to work. And it didn't happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. And so then, you know, you start seeing all these retreats and these compromises. And, you know, one of the, one of the you know, most telling things about the difference between Lenin and Stalin is that although Lenin uh, was Russian and Stalin was from the country of Georgia, Stalin actually knew Russia better than, knew the Soviet Union better than Lenin did because Stalin spent so much time in prisons all over, 
Russia, whereas Lenin spent a lot of his time in exile thinking about Hegel, about thinking about, you know, philosophy. Um, and that we can talk about why, wh what were some of the key mistakes that Lenin made. That's a whole separate uh, discussion. Uh, and what did he get right, which is uh, something. Uh, and what was the main gift that Lenin gave to China? It's, it's the Leninist party system. Uh, which, by the way, was adopted by both the nationalist and the communist. Mm -hmm. um, but in the case of Stalin, uh, whether he's just a dark character or whether uh, having to prepare the Soviet Union uh, to to deal with uh, the failure of the revolution, uh, while also rebuild and 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 arm for the growing Nazi threat, uh, and then how that kicks off a cycle of violence that doesn't culminate until um, uh, Berea is killed by, by uh, Khrushchev at all. Um, it, it is, and then we initiate destalinization. Um, uh, it's, it's safe to say that, that the Soviet party, uh, for a number of reasons, did not develop and did not professionalize the way the Chinese did. Mm -hmm. okay. And we see these accounts of, of uh, Castro when he when he first goes to the Soviet Union and Castro's you know he's a revolutionary and he's got his shit together and he's horrified at how drunk and and goofy and disheveled the Soviet leaders are at that point you mm -hmm. know um, and uh, you know I uh, so there's there is this sort of very and, and we know from from some of the accounts that when Mao went to the Soviet Union Mao was was angry he didn't like Stalin and we know that um, that uh, the Stalin refused to support the Chinese in North Korea, and maybe maybe Mao held Stalin in part responsible for his son's death, or maybe it w that wasn't really a, a problem. I don't know, but um, but the, the 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 key issue is, uh, um, you know, how do we how do we look at what came out of that? And and the answer is. Khrushchev, okay, Khrushchev comes out of it, and Khrushchev is probably more talented than we like to remember him, but Khrushchev was also an idealist who tried to get rid of the nasty material reality that had accumulated because of this horrible historical period transition from the failure of the communist revolution to the survival and, uh, of, of, of uh, of the war against Hitler and and you know, uh, and then trying to draw a line under that period, um, but the, one of those interesting insights I saw recently, or actually a few years ago, is that uh, Gorbachev is is the is the political child of Khrushchev. That Gorbachev was a idealist communist believer who his, polo his, his political worldview was formed uh, in that period when Khrushchev was in control. And that when it came down to, you know, trying to reform, I mean, what was, what was the great, if we compare the Chinese reforms versus the Soviet reforms, which one was the more authentic reform, Marxist reform, right? And this, this is, a, is, is, should be so exceedingly apparent, but is, is, is runs contrary to the narrative that you hear. If yeah. you're a Marxist, what do you reform first? Um, the economic base. The e economic base, yeah. right? Because everything flows from the base. And what did the Soviets reform first? Information. The political system. The political stuff. Yeah, they you're didn't, right. They did. Right. And so, what collapsed? The the political system became disconnected from the economic system, and done. Okay, mm -hmm. whereas the Chinese said, "Okay, here's what we do: we reform the economic system first, and then we adjust." Right. Mm -hmm. So, how we think, how we theorize, how we build, all of this will flow from the material reality that is feeding us and that is protecting us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess just like something interesting to maybe kind of finish up here. I feel like some of the broader kind of implications of what you were talking about, um, you know, you mentioned like the information age and the importance that that played on it and um, the cultural revolution being 
in a way for Mao to bridge that gap and be able to bring China into this information age and be a, a large player in it. Um, you know, if you think about the Soviet Union and China's path, the Soviet Union thought that they would spread communist and socialist ideas through the common turn, you know, getting all the parties together in one place, helping export revolutions abroad, this kind of thing. Um, you know, the common turn, it, it ends up getting dissolved under Stalin in like the early 40s. They, they realized that it wasn't, you know, people in these other countries were viewing everything that came from the common turn as like Soviet led. So they didn't, um, people weren't seeing um, movements that were involved with the common turn as being you know specifically they, they saw them as being like russian orientated but china you're describing um that you know they get close to the united states but they're recognizing i mean they're not fools so of course they know that you know the united states is still their number one enemy a lot of times communists now they they don't like the three worlds theory because they say china was saying that the united states and the soviet union were equally um like equally imperialist countries and such but you're kind of saying okay i recognize there's a difference between the soviet union and, and the united states but america overcoming the united states is the long-term goal whereas the the ussr they saw them as the way on the way out anyway um so well let's be clear the the the, the soviet union even at the height was never uh, in terms of its economic capacity and, and what we think was its overall power uh, never gets past um, some estimates say at 25 percent of what the U.S. has others say a third yeah uh, some people go as high as a half uh, China now is expected to equal the U.S. by 2035 that that number is that date's probably going to come sooner now mm -hmm. um and uh, China is a close second now, much, much closer, has closed the gap with the United States, even, even much more so than the Soviet Union did at its height. Um, and so that's, that's what's really concerning people in Washington now. Yeah. The other part of it is, um, that said, the world was divided into two spheres mm -hmm. and in the Soviet sphere Moscow ruled and uh, Shlevov Zizek and others make this point and I have a, I've, I criticize Zizek more than I than I than I um, support him uh, although uh, he, he comes to this point quite often and I think his comments on Stalin are, are very fair and, and he, in some of his discussions he has some very sober Assessments again. He's one of these guys who has no understanding of China, mm -hmm. but um, Zizek says, you know, the idea was that the Soviet Union would extract all of these benefits from the Soviet uh, from the Soviet system and the, and these other satellites mm -hmm. in the Soviet, you know, whether we call them the part of the Soviet Empire or not, and that they would use this to. Uh, to create what was known as actually existing socialism in the Soviet Union. So at least one part had it and could experiment with it and figure out what worked and also create benefits that could then go back down the line. So, you know, it's almost like the old Chinese, the Deng Xiaoping Chinese saying, uh, some will get rich first and then we'll, you know, invest that wealth in other parts of the country. And some people say that the Soviets were doing that. And other people say, actually, you know, Romania and these other countries were a tremendous economic burden on the Soviet Union. They had tremendous capital outlays. I think that kind of misses um, the point. I mean, some people say this now that there's this tremendous cost to the United States with the dollar as a supranational currency. But it, it fails to acknowledge because it's impossible to quantify the benefits we get mm -hmm. from that power, right? The fact that we can just will a trillion dollars into existence to uh, uh, solve the liquidity problem at the height of the global financial crisis in 2008, or that we could magically increase the money supply by 20% last year. And everyone wonders, well, we have inflation this year, and well, there's global inflation and global supply chain problems, right? It's because the dollar could just 
create wealth in ways that no other country could mm -hmm. at the Federal Reserve and uh, use that to save um, things. So yeah, that's uh, so that's part of the. Um, uh, it's in, it's impossible to quantify the value. So they could say, oh yeah, we had these capital outlays to Romania or Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia or whatever. But how much money they're getting or how much value they're getting from being able to make sure that they have those markets and that they have that security and that that center is secure, it's difficult to quantify. Yeah, um, yeah we, we, we're going to probably be like five Do minutes. you need to leave? I mean, I can lock it or... Okay. Fine. Yeah. All right. For all those of you who are still listening, and I, I would assume that that's not very many after such a long and winding road. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're in uh, uh, an office here at the university and, uh, and um, because um, we couldn't get a space in the library for this talk and uh, the people who work in this office want to go home. And as good communists who support workers and not abusing them and pushing them past their limits, we're going to wrap this up soon. <laughs> but uh, any other thing to, to add before we culminate? Um, I don't have anything else to add. Honestly, I you answered most of my questions that I had there. I mean, I thought that was pretty comprehensive. Um, if anything, I think this will be good, you know, in case we want to do something like this again sometime, you know, this will kind of set a good foundation for like, you know, sure, the, they, all this, all these topics. And let's be clear, you know, what I've, what I've posed here today is, is not what I'm asserting is absolutely the history. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is, if we look at that history through dialectical and historical materialism, and if we make sense of all the things that actually happen, as opposed to all the narratives that got attached to that along the way, and that the legacies of those narratives remain and are, and are still being contested, um, what makes sense is what I described. Now, whether or not whether or not one believes that or can accept that or follow that. Uh, and I, I myself, I go, oh, uh, I don't know if that's, if that's, but it, but it's the only way that I can really make sense of it, again from a mark from a from an authentic Marxist perspective, but making sense of it from 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 a Maoist perspective and understanding that Mao, I believe, was an authentic Marxist, and even even more authentic Marxist than 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 anyone the Soviet Union ever produced. Um, uh, because I think he understood dialectics in a way that no other Soviet, uh, above all Lenin, because we, uh, this is a whole different topic, but the way Lenin, uh, Lenin uh, more often cites Engels, you know, than, than Marx himself. Uh, and uh, there are some problems with this because Engels is, is kind of a Hegelian and his dialectics is kind of an idealist. And um, this is precisely what the, 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 uh, the Marxist in China were unable to abide by because their their dialectics was more grounded in in a in a culture and language that that was rooted in Yin Yang thought. So anyway, that's a whole separate discussion. But that's why we see Mao repudiating, in effect, it's it's that's the subtext of his two texts on on contradiction and on practice is is really repudiating the Soviet uh, understanding of dialectics in 1937. Okay, uh, and that's why the year, the next year, Stalin publishes his book on dialectical and historical materialism to repudiate Mao Zedong, to say that no, the Soviets understand this, and the and the Chinese have this primitive, yin yang, uh, uh, Taoistic understanding of dialectic, which is of course facetious. There's nothing simplistic uh, about uh, Taoism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, that's the way I kind of am viewing like this is because you said, you know, this is your analysis. This is you've looked into the Cultural Revolution and these other events, and this is the conclusion you've come to. It's not uh, the conclusion I've come to. It's a, it's a. It, let's say it's a thesis. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. a thesis that that if we say okay, if we had to fit a narrative to the actual historical facts that explains everything and gets us from point A to point Z. This is the only one that I can see mm -hmm. that explains all those points, even though it runs contrary <laughs> to all the other versions of history. Right. F uh, from, you know, uh, from the official Chinese party version to the leftist to uh, don't like the Chinese version to whatever it is, to the to the right wing capitalist bourgeoisie mm -hmm. version of history. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, it's an uncomfortable narrative, but uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, let's I guess, advance it. Let's advance it as a theory and leave it at that. Yeah, I feel that. Well, I'll I'll just finish by saying when it it does advance for me too as well because the more I study this, you know, the cultural revolution over the last couple of years, the more that my understanding of it changes as well. So I assume that's probably somewhat of an ongoing process, like as you research more. So um, that's totally understandable as well. And that's why this episode, I'm hoping it can be a good introduction since I'm not totally um, familiar with this as much as I should yet. But but yeah, we thank you so much for um, for being on the show. I'm glad we could finally do this. Um, yeah, did you have anything you wanted to finish out and say before you leave here? No, I just want to say to, to anyone out there who's, you know, uh, who is engaged in, in learning, uh, I salute you. And anyone who's engaged in the struggle, I salute you too. And uh, um, I got my ass kicked bad many years ago. I'm an older guy now. I'm a single parent. Uh, I'm sorry that I left you behind, but... Uh, um, uh, you have your work to do and uh, I wish you the best with it um, so get to it <laughs> yeah all right and that is it for part two of our interview and stay tuned for part three which is coming sometime soon next week all right thanks